joining us for today's workshop and webinar on how to boost your business acumen to build your credibility. You know, here at Value Selling, we're often asked, how do we improve our ability to make executive sales calls? How do we get our people to call higher? And when we get into those executive ranks of our organizations, how can we be most effective? Well, the reality is, in order to do that, we need to understand executives, what they think about, how they measure their business, and become their peer. My name is Julie Thomas, and I'm going to be your guide for about the next 45 to 50 minutes talking about some strategies, tools, and techniques of how you can boost your business acumen for the purpose of building your credibility. Um, when we have business acumen, we are able to change the conversation that we're having with our prospects. And that is really the goal of that. When we change the conversation, there's a couple of outcomes that come, come from that. Number one, we build strategic relationships. When we partner from a business perspective, we build strategic relationships. When we build strategic relationships, we have the opportunity to sell more of our stuff whatever our stuff is, and to potentially lock competitive alternatives out when we're successful at that level. The other um, benefit of uh, having business acumen as sales professionals, we better understand how to be business professionals in our own companies that we work with. What is the impact of discounting? That How does that trickle through our company? How was the impact of our ability to forecast, forecast trickle down through our company? So we're going to address all of that. I will let you know that we'll be taking questions. So if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A um, panel here, and I'll address them either as they come in or as we see them at the end of um, ses uh, today's session. One last thing that I want to mention as we dive into this is today's session is being recorded and you will have the ability to access that um, at the end of today from the valueselling.com website under resources. The recording as well as the slides will be up there, but if you want to just download the slides, you can find them in the handout section of your GoToWebinar um, panel here on your uh, desktop. As we go through today's content, I also want to let you know that we are going to be talking specifically about business acumen. We're going to be talking about this in the context of understanding how for-profit commercial entities work and how they're measured. That said, these same exact principles apply whether you're calling on the education sector, the government sector, not-for-profits, hospitals, or any other type of industry or category that might not be a uh, traditional corporation and how they, they operate. So while I talk about things in the terms, in the context of corporate metrics and profit and loss for commercial entities, that does not mean that these same principles, these same tools, these same processes can't be used if you're working with some of these other types of companies. The key to being able to have executive sales calls is to be being prepared for them. And here's a nice little quote that I, that I like to, to share when I think about preparation. There is no silver bullet to success. It is the intersection of hard work and preparation. And we need to be prepared every time we're meeting with an executive. Oftentimes we only get one shot to have um, that executive conversation and we want to be as best prepared for that as possible. So here's what we're going to be talking about specifically today. Why business acumen is even important. I touched on that earlier, but why do we need it? And what is business acumen itself? Then how do we take that to engage in a business conversation? And we want to understand that because there's a key relationship between the business conversation, the business metrics that we have, 
and how we can justify our sale or help our customers build the case to do business with us. And at the end of the day, this is all about how we improve our ability to be a better business professional. In today's world, one of the transitions that sales professionals are making, especially in the world of B2B sales, is moving from a salesperson to a business professional that has the credibility to become a trusted advisor. Now many of you on the line and many of the customers that Value Selling has, has sales teams that are very technically astute in the products and services they sell. So whether you're in the publishing industry or the technology industry or human resources services or some type of manufacturing, the sales organizations that we tend to work with are very well versed in the products, services, and solutions they offer. Their challenge is how they translate and connect that technical insight and knowledge and that breadth of knowledge to actually having an impact that's measurable on the companies they try and do do business with. And that connection is from technical to business where value selling often has tremendous value with our clients in closing that gap. In today's session, we're going to talk just a little bit about some of the ways that we work with clients to do that. So let's think about this. What do customers truly expect from partners? Well, in order for us to become strategic and collaborative and the go-to business professional that our customers expect us to be, we have to be able to demonstrate a few things. And it's in a couple of key areas that we have to be able to demonstrate that. First and foremost, we have to demonstrate to our prospects that we understand them. We understand them in the role that they're sitting on in. If we're calling on a chief marketing officer versus a chief financial officer, their view of their corporate operations is going to be different because their role and responsibility in that corporation is going to be different. So we need to show that we understand those, exact, those individuals and where they sit. We also need to understand what's going on in their organization. What's going on in um, their businesses? What are their goals and objectives? Where is the struggle in accomplishing them? What are they trying to accomplish as they move forward? Every company is trying to do something. They're either trying to maintain, they're trying to grow, they're trying to improve operational efficiency, productivity. Every organization that you are calling on has some sort of a goal. Now that may be articulated differently depending on who you are and what they do, but they do all have goals and objectives that they're working for. We're trying to understand those so that we can contextually identify where those challenges might be. In addition to that, we want to understand the industry that we operate in. What are the alternatives that our prospects can go to for some of this? Somebody once told me that nobody wants to be sold, yet everybody enjoys buying things. And our challenge and opportunity as we transition from sales professional to trusted advisor is to focus on helping them buy as to pushing what we have to sell. What does that mean? It means that we are not pushing, we're not meeting with resistance, we're creating pull based on the needs, the problems, and the business opportunities that we identify with our client. So if that's what we're trying to do to be successful, let's look at some research that I just found recently in a Forbes magazine article that talked about a survey that was done with a number of executives across a number of industries. And they said, this is why sales reps fail when they get to their office. And they categorized it into seven different areas. 
Number one, they don't listen. They don't listen to me. They don't listen to what we're saying. They have their own agenda that they're pushing. And they talk too much. They're coming in and pitching. They're, they're talking too much, which is kind of the flip side of not listening. I can't listen if my mouth is moving. They don't know anything about me. They don't know anything about my role. They often don't know anything about my company. It's amazing to me how many sales reps have called on me and they do not understand at even a basic level what my business is and what we do. Another thing that frustrates them is they don't follow up. They overcommit. They make promises about anything and often don't commit. They don't tell the truth. I just read a research study this morning based on Harvard Business Review, and it did an analysis between top performing reps, which they defined as reps that were consistently at 125% of plan, to reps that were consistently between 80 and 100% of plan. The high performing reps did not think it was ever appropriate to misrepresent their capabilities where a higher percentage in the reps between 80 and 100% felt that it was okay to embellish or to omit critical information if it would help them get to the sale. I thought that was really interesting in terms of how can we ever expect to have a trust-based relationship if they don't think that we are completely honest with them about the limits or the opportunities that we can bring to them. They don't understand what I need. Many executives report that sales reps come in with a solution and they're not looking at what problems they solve. They're a solution in search of a problem as opposed to recognizing the problems, gaining agreement on that, and then trying to collaborate on a solution. And last but not least, they're overly aggressive. My experience with overly aggressive people is A, it's a result of all of these other things. They don't listen, they talk. Certainly they don't take no for an answer, but there is a period of time where persistence turns to annoyance, where, where persistence goes beyond um, your ability to work with that sales rep and we end up, that executive, and we end up potentially turning them off. So these are what we don't want to be. We don't want to be the people that demonstrate these capabilities. We don't want to exhibit this because even if we're knowledgeable and we exhibit some of these characteristics or behaviors, we're likely to turn off our prospects. So let's dive into what is business acumen. Well, business acumen is really the foundation that executives need to make good business decisions. They need keenness, quickness, good judgment, the ability to execute. That is what business acumen is. From a sales perspective, business acumen is our ability to understand how someone else's business works and operates. Your business acumen will be demonstrated in how you understand your prospects, their business how they make money, how they spend money, how cash flows through their organization, the regulatory constraints that they might have, and all of those elements that we want to understand to partner with the executives that we're calling on. Some elements of business acumen come into what we call business literacy. Now, literacy, just like reading literacy, is your ability to understand something. So if I'm literate, I can read something and understand it. In business, literacy means I can look at the financial documents that a company releases and financial metrics that they have and understand what they mean. I can understand not only what the terminology means, but the context of why that term, that metric, that report is important for a business to, to manage. It also means that I understand the discipline in the various areas of that organization. 
Examples of some of those areas might be financial, might be accounting, marketing operations, but it could also be sales. It could be customer service. It could be engineering. I work with healthcare organizations that have sales organizations, and they have subject matter experts, maybe former doctors or nurses, people that bring tremendous industry um, experience and credibility to what they're trying to sell, and they sit in, in that role. Um, of customer um, experience management. Uh, the same is true with companies that we have that are in the publishing industry, selling to school districts. They have experts on education on their staff and content experts in curriculum. Um, uh, many of the clients that we work with have got all different types of organizations as a part of them, but the key is most organizations have very similar roles. They're either making something, they're measuring something, they're selling something, um, or they're managing something in, the, in their businesses. And understanding what and how they do that is important. So why do we need to understand this business credibility and this business acumen and be literate in business terminology? Well, it's so that we can use that knowledge to engage executive decision makers. We want to go through what value selling calls a three-step process to gain specific literacy for the specific target accounts that we have that we can understand better in order to better engage those, those executives. So we talk and, and, and teach our clients how to leverage this three-step process. Step one is investigate. How do I understand and research what is important to know about the companies that I'm calling on? And we walk, we'll walk you through some of the steps of what we do that. Then what do I do once I have that information to predict not only who I should engage to talk about what I've learned, but why engaging on them might be relevant to them and how they view or they perceive the research and the analysis and the insights and the conclusions that I've come through when I'm investigating. And once we've done that, we prepare for those calls. We prepare to get those calls and we prepare to execute on those calls once we get them. So as we go through this investigate stage, we walk through a very specific key areas that we think you need to know about. And we break it into two different areas. What do we need to know about our buyer? And what do we want to ask our buyer? So when we think about what we we want to know about our, our, our buyer or what we want to predict about our buyer or, or research about our buyer, there's a couple key areas that we want to do that research in. We want to know about their company. We want to know about the industry that they operate in. Many of you are calling on clients that are highly regulated. And we want to understand those industry dynamics that we, that we operate in. We want to understand the finances of that company. Is it a financially healthy company? Or is it in a trouble state? Are there trends that we can identify by looking at their public financial records that will give us clues to that? And then last but not least, we want to know who the people are that are leading those organizations. Who are they? What's their background? What are they likely to be interested in? Interested in and how are they organized? And we walk people through this investigative um, a, a tool to help them investigate exactly what they need to know to be successful in preparing and predicting for a sales call with those individuals. Then once we've done that research and we have the opportunity to gain access and engage in a conversation with those people, we want to use that foundation of what we've learned to prepare good, relevant questions to understand how the people that we're talking to see the see or confirm the conclusions that we've come to. 
So we want to talk to them about their view of the business. We've, if we have recognized through our research that a company is losing market share, we want to ask the people in that organization, what is going on with the market? Is it expanding and there's new players? Maybe you're still growing, but you're not growing at a rate as high as you used to be. Or is there something else going on? What, how do you see that? And where are those opportunities can be? We then want to talk about what are the root causes of that problem. If you are losing market share, why? Is it because your products aren't right? Is it because the market has changed? Is it because it's more difficult for you to differentiate yourself? Is it because your people are working on the wrong things? I don't know what those problems are and the root cause to the issues until we have that conversation. Most importantly, we want to understand what the value of addressing those business issues might be, and then who, based on the people that we've researched, have the power? Who gained the most from those business issues that we've identified, or will lose the most if those business issues aren't addressed? And in the value selling framework, we call that getting to the power, the person who has the most to gain or the most to lose if something doesn't change in that organization. Do we know who those people are and are we having insightful, relevant conversations with those people based on the research we've had? So let's talk a little bit more about this whole investigative um, perspective. And we're going to talk about it from how you move from kind of a macro view of doing research to more of a micro view and a micro view being the specific company that you're calling on. But we want to start with understanding a macro view of what is going on with that company. What's going on in their industry? If I am in the healthcare industry calling on pharmacies, for example, what do I know about the pharmacy industry and the regulatory issues facing it? If I'm calling on School districts, do I understand what's going on um, in a state-by-state -state basis for K-12 through school? Or if I'm calling on higher ed, the same thing. If I'm calling on manufacturing companies, do I understand what's going on not only in their manufacturing industry, but in the key customer industries that they're selling to? And there's lots of different places we can get that industry perspective. We can get it from trade associations, trade presses, trade sites. Um, if you just Google some of those industries, you will find lots of places, blogs, and, and resources that aggregate that information. That stuff is free. You may also have access to a number of resources that your companies may provide to you to do that. For those of you that have got specific territories, you want to supplement that with local information. What are the local business journals, the local business sites that you might learn from um, and keep your eye on in your local industry? Again, at a macro level, if you look at your territory, but if I'm calling on small and medium-sized business, I want to keep my eye on not only the business section of my paper, but the business journal or local business press in that. Often those talk about comings and goings when people are, are moving um, positions. They often talk about which companies are getting funded, which new companies are moving into the, industry, into the area, et cetera, and give you tremendous amount of insight um, from those uh, types of information. And then last but not least, we want to look at the micro metrics and analysis that we can do in the company itself. Certainly we can look at financial statements if they're a publicly held company. We can look at the executive messages where we could get clues to what are the number one strategies and initiatives that those organizations are facing, as well as the number one risks that they see in the future. We can look at analyst reports and analyst coverage in some of those industries um, and, and start to get a feel for that. If we're calling on technology, we may have access to industry watchers in that company, in that specific industry. 
If I'm calling on technology companies, I might look at, see if I can see what is Gardner saying about them or Forrester saying about them or some of these other types of companies. If it's marketing company, I might, an, uh, an upstart marketing company, I'd probably be really interested in what Serious Decisions, who's a market leader in that space, um, and analyzes those companies. What are they saying about them? But really, it's that macro to the micro. The macro gives us the context. The micro gives us the specifics when we do the research and understanding what clients is go going through. Some of the questions and topics that we want to look at um, are, are, are some of these things. We want to look at earnings, for sure. If they're publicly held company, we want to know how much money they're making, how much money they're keeping. Are they satisfied with that? Are they trying to grow that in any way? We want to know a little bit about the company themselves. What's their history? Um, how did they get where they are today? And those types of things. We also want to look at how does the company, can we tell how the company describes, manages, and measures their business health? I work with some companies that have got very specific terminology about how they measure their business. And if I'm calling on them, I need to understand that terminology. I need to adapt to their language to have credible, relevant conversations with their executives. So whether it is some sort of a, uh, some clients might talk about bookings, or they might talk about revenue recognition, or contract value increase, or wallet share, or there's any number of individual terms that many of our customers might be able to talk about. Renewal rates would be another example. Customer experience, net promoter value. Maybe I'm in a business, maybe I'm calling on a school district that is really trying to understand um, their net promoter, promoter value in in that industry or consumer business that and that might be a key metric that drives decisions and investments in that company. Why do we do this investigation? Well, it's so that we can predict what would be a relevant topic to engage a conversation on. This is all about trying to figure out what we're going to talk about when we identify and gain access to those different executives. So I look at this as kind of the who, what, and how. If I'm doing this research, I want to understand, number one, the business executives. Who typically owns that? Who's going to be responsible for managing that or changing that if changes need to be made? Who is the executive who is likely to be the individual that's held accountable for some of what I have discovered in that investigative mode and research mode that might create opportunities for my products, services, or solutions. Then I want to predict the what. And this is the goals and objectives. The what is, what are they going to do about it? Well, we want to grow XYZ percentage. Our objective is to become the premier provider in this area. Our, our objective is to, to do, be, get, grow something. Often those are articulated in business metrics. That's the what I want to understand. So I want to know who, I want to know what, and then as best I can, I want to predict the how. And the how is, is typically when companies articulate their strategies or their initiatives. Um, initiative could be another way for strategy. And the crazy thing about some of this language is two executives could describe them very differently. One, object, one uh, executive may say that a, a goal and objective are exactly the same thing. Another one might say an objective and a strategy is the same thing. But understanding how they articulate that is part of the process as well. But strategies and initiatives are typically the areas where people have decided how we're going to do something that are recognized, funded, and are getting the attention of the executive suite. We might have an initiative to lower our cost of sales. Therefore, 
we are going to transition all of our outside salespeople, 50% of, of them to inside sales. And not only are we going to do that, we're going to move out of Silicon Valley, which is high cost of living, to an area where we may have lower cost of living and therefore be able to attract entry-level talent better. That could be our initiative to achieve the objective of lowering the cost of sales. We could have a goal to enter new markets and then have some strategies about doing that, identifying maybe partners to start with that, creating um, subsidiaries in outlying companies. All of those could be the strategies to achieve the goal. So as you do this research, the, the point of it is to identify the who, the what, and the how so that you can start to have conversations about that. Now, in value selling, we have some very specific terminology, and I'm just going to quickly kind of go through this um, with you. Many of you um, on here are, are very familiar with this, but but really, I talked there about business objectives on that last slide. Our objective is to find what we call a business issue associated with that. If an executive does not see that their objective is either difficult to achieve or at risk for achieving, they are likely not to have a reason to change. So business objectives are certainly important to understand, but it's what we call the business issue that creates an opportunity for you to create hooks for your products and services. The direct root cause of what those business issues, why those business issues might exist is what we call problems. And that could be people problems, maybe I don't have the right people, maybe I need to reskill the people, maybe I need to reorganize them. It could be process, maybe I need to automate some antiquated processes, maybe I need to eliminate some processes that are in cost but no value. Or maybe I need to upgrade technology or look at technology enablement for some of those things. But the problems could be any combination of those types of things. And that's key for us to, to understand the differences between those three things. Without understanding a business issue which sits between that objective and their root cause of their problems, we're at risk to not really understand the why they might might want to do something differently. Beyond that, we've got two more terms that I just want to talk about. Number one is the solution. Obviously, we are there to sell something. No one is surprised when somebody shows up, no matter what your title is, that at the end of the day, your objective is to see if there might be a fit for your product, services, or solutions, their organization, and if that fit is tight enough, important enough, relevant enough, for them to actually take out the checkbook and buy your products and services. Nobody is confused that that's why we're there. But at the end of the day, we can't go in and lead with our solution. We need to get first agreement on those issues and problems so that we can get agreement on the solution. And if we don't get agreement on the issues and the problems, before we talk about the solution, it'll be very difficult for us to ever be able to build a customer-specific value proposition. Value is the way a customer answers the question, is it worth it to do business with you now? Is it worth it for them to do business with you now? And that value, that justification, will come through some sort of a business metric quantification. Could be return on investment. Could be reduction in cost. Could be improvement in sales. Improvement in operating efficiency. I could come up with a million different metrics. Return on assets. But if we don't understand those financial metrics to begin with, we are going to be very challenged at understanding how we can facilitate and contribute to enabling a prospect to build the case to justify the position. So those are some of the value selling terminologies. The key 
of some of this research that we're doing is to identify and get at what these potential business issues are. So what is a business issue? We're often, we're often talked about, talk about that. I, I've already described the difference between a business objective, a goal, a strategy, and, and a business issue. But here's a couple things to ask yourself. Does it have a measurable business impact? Can you measure what that business issue is? Does it actually align to a state of business objective? And is it time bound? Time bound is a huge one, and it gives you tremendous insight into the level of urgency or timing and prioritization that you may get from a prospect. Recently, I have been uh, working with a, a couple of clients in very different industries, but going through some opportunity assessments with them as they went through their uh, quarterly business reviews for the second quarter, just to to give another perspective on how qualified those opportunities are and what we might be able to do um, to help them. And it, it was interesting as I talked with them, they all had the business issue nailed, supposedly. And the business issue for both of these industries had to do with eliminating costs, reducing costs, cost, 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 cost. They gotta drive costs out of the business. And when I asked the question, to virtually every sales rep that I was talking to, when did they have to demonstrate that that cost savings has actually occurred? No one had an answer. So I pushed back and questioned, do you really have a business issue? Yeah, it'd be great if someday I grow this business, but if I don't have a plan, a goal, or objective to grow it in 2017, you selling something to me that will enable that growth may not at all have any urgency or resonate with me. So are your business issues time bound? Is there a specific measurable interval of time where someone's gonna put a stake in the ground and say, I've gotta do this by? Key to whether or not you have a business issue. Since it is measurable, it has a cost and value associated with it. Maybe it's an opportunity cost, Maybe it's um, a cost, a, a true cost savings, but do we understand what that is? And then key to understanding that business issue is to really understanding, based on who you're calling on, how they articulate it. So I could argue that operational efficiency, improved productivity, and cost savings are three different ways to say almost the same exact thing. But when I am selling to an executive, it is critical that I understand how that individual articulates that business issue. Because if you're, if I'm calling on you and you tell me you are responsible for improving operational efficiency of your division, by December 31st, 2017, and I start to talk to you about cost savings, I run the risk of having misalignment with language. So it's critical, especially for the, those of you that are calling on multiple people in multiple different roles and, and uh, perspectives in an organization, that you talk to them and understand their articulation of that business issue. Very, very important. Important. So why is, again, why is this important? Well, well, business value in the business case will always be in the context of the business issue. As a matter of fact, if I'm talking to a sales rep who says, I, I, I'm really struggling to, to, to help this client justify the sale, and we really don't know what, what the business value is, I, I almost always um, go back to them and say, I think you should test the validity of the business issue that you think you have connected to this opportunity. Because if you can't get enough value, there is likely that could be the area that you have. have. And then again, the whole key to value selling is, is getting our prospects to answer the question, is it worth doing business with you now. So is the benefit I'm gonna get 
greater than the cost I'm going to spend. And we all know that cost today isn't always only the direct cost of doing business with you. There could be some total cost of ownerships associated with you. Maybe there's training, maybe there's re-engineering, maybe I've got to um, uh, hire different people to do different things. So often that cost is more than our purchase. So our savvy as a value selling sales rep is to make sure that we can uncover as many value streams as possible that will contribute to that overall value proposition. So, so, so in order to do that, again, it's business acumen. If the business issue is measured and tangible, the value of impacting that business issue will also be measured and tangible. So again, all of this is to prepare. It's to prepare for those conversations. It's to prepare good questions to engage that, that executive. It's to prepare likely credibility introductions that you can use to introduce yourself to that prospect. It's to prepare good messaging in the campaigning when you are trying to gain access to those executives. And really understanding when you get in front of them, how am I going to ask credible, relevant, knowledgeable, and insightful questions to be successful and be perceived as that business professional that can sit arm in arm with them at the same table and collaborate to add value to their business. To sell to a business executive in today's world, you have to become a business executive yourself, which means we have to speak the same language of them. And when we are successful doing that, we, be, we improve tremendously our credibility. And what is credibility? Credibility in my, in, in, in my world and, and, uh, that I think of, it's where my, my being believable and also being convincing is the same thing. So in, for, for me to be credible, I have to have confidence in the products and services that I represent. I have to be convinced that whatever I'm asking you to do is absolutely in your best interest. And if I am not convinced of that and a prospect sees through that, I have zero credibility. Not only do I have to be convincing, I have to be believable. What I'm saying has to be believable. If it's too good to be true, maybe it is. Am I actually being honest and specific to be believable? And it's when those two things come together that we can be improve our credibility. And when we improve our credibility, we improve our ability to be trusted. And when we improve our ability to be trusted, we, we lock in the relationships at those executive levels that we want to lock in to be successful as sales professionals. So that combination of those three things that we've talked about is really what drives our ability to have executive sales calls. It's the knowledge that we have, not only the knowledge about our products and services, that's a given. We have to know what we're selling. We have to know the industry that we operate in. We have to know also our customers and be able to demonstrate our knowledge of their world and their paradigm. You know, it's interesting. Every time I talk with a, a new prospect, at some point in the first meeting, I will hear something that says, you know, it's really different here. And let me tell you why it's really different. And they are absolutely right in that from their view, their organization is very different and the challenges that they're having are very different. And certainly how they articulate them are very different. But in my experience, many of those challenges are not unique to that organization. They may be different in how they describe them. They may dip, be different in terms of the symptoms or the effects that have 
have bubbled to the surface, but the root cause of many of those issues are not different. So it's always un interesting to understand how we engage to create that context. We're also doing that research to make sure we're relevant. We want to be relevant in understanding and tailoring our messages, understanding the context of our customers and prospects, understanding what's going on in our geography. I was making sales calls a couple months ago on the East Coast in a in an area of the country that's having some real economic issues. Companies are moving out. And so small businesses in that area are really struggling because they're the real estate market is, is in trouble and all of the fallout when companies move and take their employees with them. That situation is very different than other parts of the country that I might be calling on. And I need to understand that relevance so that I can tailor my conversations and be empathetic as I discuss them. And with those two things, I can improve my credibility in being believable as well as convinced in my my uh, products and service. So what can we to do today? Well, number one, the question I'd have for each of you is what do you do to, today to stay current on your prospects, your industry, in order to be relevant? What are you reading? What, do you, what, what sites do you visit? What blogs in your industry are you looking at? What, do you have Google Alerts set up for some of your key clients so that you can see when things change? There's so many technology triggers now that can be sent that don't cost a dime that you can use to stay current and relevant. And then there's the old traditional stuff. You know, you might actually still pick up a magazine if you're at the airport or look at an online um, periodical in your specific industry. Do you know your buyer's industry? Can you learn more about their industry? Can you learn more about how they measure their businesses and what's going on? How, how strong is your financial literacy? Do you understand the difference between an income statement and a balance sheet and the terminology on each one of them? Do you understand how cash flows through a typical business and how that might impact those financial statements? Do you understand the key roles of the key executives in those organizations and what would be typically their roles and responsibilities to be working with? But there's likely opportunities for all of us to strengthen our financial literacy. Do you have a plan to research your companies? Do you know specifically what to look for so that you can gather that specific knowledge in order to predict and prepare for engagement? But not feel like you have to do so much research that you can never make that sales call. And that's the balance I think that some of us have. Some of us don't have the confidence that we don't have enough information to be relevant and knowledgeable, so we keep researching and it almost becomes a barrier to us making that sales call. We've got to find that balance. And then, of course, we've got to ultimately talk to people at you know, business to business sales, which 99% of you on the phone today are in some sort of a business to business to sale, we all know that businesses don't buy, people who work for businesses buy. So we still need to find who are those people that we engage, what do they care about, and how can we gain access to them. And that's all part of that research. Um, in the resources here, if you're interested, is an overview of the new program that we have called Executive Speech Speak, which is a program that not only talks about all of the knowledge that you need to know to do this well, but gives you tools and interactive research mechanisms to pull and uh, store this information so that you can use it in the engagement strategy very easily. And at the end of the day, knowledge is of no value unless we put it into practice. It's not what we know as salespeople as much as what we do with what we know. And as sales professionals, it's the behaviors and the application of this knowledge that leads to our success. So as we think about what we need to know, and there's certainly some things we need to know, but what are some of those um, 
things that we can do to apply this as quickly as possible. So thank you for spending some time with us this morning. Let me, uh, let's, let's see what types of questions we have in here um, as we talk about this. As, as I said, I think it's key that we become business professionals. I think if I'm going to be a good solid sales professional, I need to become a business professional. And at the end of the day, for those of you that have been in sales for any period of time, my personal opinion is having a business conversation is 10 times easier than having a technical conversation. When I'm having a technical conversation with somebody, sometimes they're nitpicking the tiny little nuances and features of my product. But when I'm having a business conversation with an executive, we're talking big ideas. We're talking about how we're going to make big changes in their organization. And those are energizing conversations that are much easier to have when I'm prepared to sit at that table as a peer. We know executives expect peer level value added re relationships. Last month, Mark Evans shared with us uh, a webinar on becoming that trusted advisor. We cannot be a trusted advisor if we don't know what they're talking about. So that is critical. Talking about some of that to grow our credibility is important. So let me look at some of the uh, questions that we have. I've got a couple comments here about, um, uh, about places where you can get great information and that is um, Bloomberg and Google Alerts and other online uh, portals. But here's a question. What is the best way to handle a situation when you determine the business issue decision person is not who you're talking to, even though they might tell you that they are, <laughs> that they, because they brought you into that project? Well. So there's a couple of strategies, and in, uh, in the value selling framework, we have a number of strategies of how to gain, maintain, and validate the access to executives. So one of the, the, the strategies that we talk about with our clients is, is uh, the concept of triangulation. And as a sales professional, I want to minimize my risk of getting stuck with one person by trying to cast a broader net in that organization and then asking those individuals the same set of questions in order to get closer or triangulate what might be the truth. So that would be one strategy at the outset. The second strategy is when I do sense that I am stuck or I'm told you can't talk to anybody else in that organization, now I have to bargain with resources. What do I have that they want access to a value? And how can I use that, that need that they have to get what I need, which is access and insight from the key executive that ultimately owns that? One of the things that we do know is that it's easier to get access to an executive in, in the strategy that part of their decision-making process when they are setting the strategies and they are deciding the initiatives to when they've all, um, versus when they've allocated it to a, an evaluation stage. Executives usually are involved at the beginning of the decision-making process and at the end of the decision-making process. And when you're brought in in that evaluation stage, that's where we are often um, challenged. So part of that is mitigating the risk through good relationships, proactively building relationships sooner rather than later when, when we are brought in and on an ongoing basis. So let me see what other questions we have here as I go through that, go through the paddle. What do you think is the best way to do research? Well, I think that, that really depends on, on who your targets are. Um, if you are doing business, doing, you know, working with publicly traded conversations, or excuse me, publicly traded Corporations, you have access to all their public records. By law, they have to release their, their public records on a quarterly basis, on an annual basis. There's a wealth of information in those. Um, if you're not calling on those types of companies, you, you're probably looking 
A, at their website, B, at their industry, C, at the local press and see if you can get information about that. Um, in addition, if you're calling on uh, not-for-profits, whether it's a hospital or an agency, often they do have to disclose some levels of financial information um, and you can find where those are published um, in, in terms of the public interest. So, so sometimes you have to be a sleuth and look individually to figure out what that is. Um, so um, one uh, question, um, it's interesting and, and it, it's true, um, the more strategic the product, service, or solution you sell, the more likely a business executive will be involved in that decision-making process at some point. So looking at what you sell um, and how is it positioned to impact products and services is critical to how you can gain access to those executives. So really thinking through why would somebody do business with you today and how will that improve their life in the future from a business perspective is, is critical and, and understanding what those kind of how you can position in that context is, is really important. Um, low priced um, commoditized items um, typically aren't the types of uh, products that we end up uh, working with in, in the organizations that, that we sell. Um, so with that, uh, if, if I haven't had a chance to get to your questions, um, I will uh, respond to them in email because we'll get all of this information. So please share that with us. Um, I do want to let you know that our next webinar on June 15th, it'll be here before we know it, we're going to talk about team selling and how team dynamics work successfully when you are a sales rep coordinating a whole posse of people to help you manage an account or an opportunity. Last but not least, if you like today's webinar, please share it on Twitter. If you learned something, please share it on Twitter at valueselling.com. If you haven't found us on LinkedIn or Facebook, please join us. Uh, join our community on both of those platforms. And if there's anything I can do for you or questions I can address specifically, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly and connect with me on LinkedIn. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you on June 15th. Bye-bye.